Good to see everyone this morning. Welcome to the winter in Florida. We did our first Christmas song. I told Danny, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very much like you have to get through Thanksgiving before Christmas Amen. starts person. And then you realize down here in South Florida, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's to get Christmas things in December, there is no more. Because everyone down here grabs it all in November. So um, so we, we got enough lights to be able to decorate the house and stuff. But it's so good to have everybody in our home. I, I'm Dave. I'm the pastor here at Good Soul Church. And we are just blessed to have you. And um, it's just an amazing time of year. We love it as a family. It's one of our favorite times of year. And uh, I can't believe it's December 2022 because almost a year ago in this season is when we started the church. And we're about to walk into 2023. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what else will, like how quickly this year went by. Um, it's a special season for us as a church because... If you, you may not know this, but we actually had a Christmas Eve service last year. It was kind of a secret service in a way. And like we didn't tell anybody, and, and uh, only people who were really doing life with us in that moment knew about it. And we had like 78 people come out. Um, and it was such a special day for a lot of us. Uh, there are people who aren't with us anymore who were in the room. And, um, and it was a great celebration of Jesus. And, but we didn't start the church until 2022. So like in January, because we wanted to start the church in prayer. And so Christmas Eve was kind of fun, like, hey, this is what we're going to do, but then officially started in January. And so we are coming up on a year, and it's so exciting to see what God has already done. Um, and we've just started the Advent season, so if you don't know much about Advent, it actually started last Sunday. I really wanted to finish up Paul's first missionary journey before we jumped into Christmas, so we did that last week. So we're starting Advent as a church this week, but it really is this celebration of preparation for Jesus to come. And so Advent actually is a Latin word called Adventus, and it actually means coming. And so in the Christian church, um, we put this on our calendars, we always have, as a preparation to when Jesus came. So it's the four weeks before Christmas. But it's also, we're always in Advent, because we're always awaiting His second coming. So it's just a preparation for His coming. So simply it means, He is coming, prepare yourself. That's what Advent means. And so that's what we're in right now as a season as a church, and all Christian churches should be in this season. And uh, different denominations will think of this season differently. Uh, but here at Good Soul Church, the way we think about it is a time of reflection on what God has already done and what He's going to do. And uh, we should count our blessings during this time. Uh, uh, it should be a season of expectation. Some churches would think it's a, a season of repentance, but be, because we live... After Jesus' time, it's actually a time of reflection and joy, knowing what he already did on the cross. Um, we need to come to him, repent, but then there's blessing on the other side of that. So it's going to be a time of celebration for Good Soul Church. Every Advent season is a time of celebration. And I wrote it this way. Um, Advent means coming, but it's expectation of and celebration of the light coming into the darkness. And that is what this season is. Because... When Jesus arrived on the scene, um, it changed everything. Everything changed in human history. Um, it actually changed all of history, not just Christian history, because everything before Christ is known as B.C., before Christ. Jesus happens, and all calendars, secular or Christian, are after Christ. It all starts when Jesus comes. And so A.D. means Anno Domini which is uh, the, a Latin word for in the year of the Lord. So some people have changed this to the before the common era and then after the common era, but really, Jesus marked all history, all human history. Whether you're secular or Christian, you believe this. And so it's cool when we talk about this story and we go through Advent and then Christmas, what it means for everyone. And so I just love that. So when Jesus arrived on the scene, I said he's a light in a dark place, right? It was a dark time in history. Uh, Israel had not heard from God in 400 years. And so they had returned to the promised land, so that promise was made. The temple had been rebuilt, but they had not heard from God directly through prophets or, or any sort of um, uh, writings down like so for 400 years. And so they were not expecting much. The Jewish people had thought God had abandoned them. So they're in this dark place. The temple's built, very religious 
very uh, you know, routine, they're kind of going through the routines, but they had not expected God to speak again. Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, ends with a promise that everything will be fulfilled. Malachi says that all the promises of the Old Testament will be fulfilled, and then the book ends, and nothing for 400 years. And that it's a dark time. It's a dark time for anyone who hadn't heard from God in that long, right? Generations. And so they'd forgotten all the promises of God. And so um, out of that darkness comes this light, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about. This star shone, uh, this baby was born in Bethlehem, and God came to earth to fulfill all of the promises of before. And so some of those Jewish people might be like, well, why wait the 400 years, right? Well, 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God came to earth at the perfectly appointed time to make the most impact for the most people. So Jesus showed up now because the Roman roads had just been built. People could write in and, and, and multiple different languages and distribute those writings, and people had, had lost all hope and had this oppression of the Roman government and everything on them to where they were desperate for something. So Jesus came when his message could be delivered, when it could go all over the world, and when people were in need of him. So I wrote it this way. God's timing is perfect, and it always achieves its intended purpose. He was not slow in coming. He came at the perfect time. And sometimes, I believe, we need a fresh perspective about common stories, like Christmas, that we all know, um, in order to understand its eternal significance. And so, the birth of Christ and his manger scene is one of those stories, right? We all have one of these in our house, or your mom did, or something's on your front lawn, whatever it is. And it's so familiar to people that I feel like sometimes we forget um, the individual stories that are happening in the scene, and how that can relate to us today. So, um, I think we get focused on the wrong things sometimes, and, and sometimes seeing things through new eyes, new perspectives, helps change our hearts and change the way we think about stuff. So, for the next four weeks, these four weeks of Advent, three Sundays and then Christmas Eve, we're going to talk about this scene, the manger scene, okay? And, uh, and, and look at it from different perspectives of what's at the manger scene, okay? And I know some people want to read ahead and like, where is Dave going with all this, right? Uh, Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2 is this, okay? Those are the only two Gospels that talk about the birth of Christ, but they talk about this. So if you want to read ahead, read those two Gospels, one, chapters 1 and 2, and you'll, you'll be able to see where I'm going. Maybe you can guess kind of what I'm going for. But, um, but let's take a look here. So we got, um, you got uh, Mary and Joseph with baby Jesus right there in the middle. I wonder if we have a camel. You got all of these farm animals, barn animals, which we're actually going to talk about that in a couple weeks, uh, what that means. You got the shepherds who are, who are manning some of the sheep. And then you got these three guys over here, these wise men. These magi, right? We, we're all familiar with this. And this is so common to us that we're thinking this is just how it was. It was so perfect. And, and there, was no, there was no blood from the, the home birth anywhere. There was, uh, there was uh, you know, no feces from the animals. And, and these, these men were just giving gifts at the moment of birth to Jesus. And this, I have to tell you, did not happen like this at all. And... Um, it's going to throw you off a little bit when I go through what the manger scene actually is. Um, it's going to change your perspective because this story is a bunch of different stories, all culminating around the birth of Jesus. And when we see their perspectives, I think it's going to change our hearts and, and how we see Christmas a little bit. So my question is, um, for you, what are you looking forward to during Christmas? Because all these people were looking forward to something different. And they thought about this moment differently. So what are we looking forward to? And what are your expectations of this season? Um, some kids in the room might be like, presents, stockings, time off from school. Right? That's what we're thinking. Or parents are thinking, um, you know, a little vacation time. Maybe work's giving me a couple weeks off. And, you know, this, maybe we'll travel a little bit. Or maybe we'll just settle. We'll just settle down, right? And then you have a... Uh, Maybe some family's coming into town, or you're going to see family, and that could be a good or bad thing for you, you know, stressful versus not stressful, right? No matter what you're looking forward to during Christmas, um, 
there's a sense of anticipation and expectation about what that is, whatever that thing is. And um, I think as we learn a little bit today about the wise men, we're going to learn uh, their perspective on all of this and maybe learn like what we should be expecting during Christmas. Because um, no matter how we look at this scene and how we look at Christmas, um, we're all a little bit excited, a little bit, a little bit nervous, and anticipating something. And so right here, you have Jesus right in the middle. And you have these three wise men with their gifts. And I have to tell you, they were never in this scene. That's a lie. It's a Hallmark holiday situation. This never happened. And these men were never here. Um, and so I think today, uh, we're going to learn why. And why it's so much better the way that God ordained it. So... I'm actually going to read to you the entire story of this moment, the wise men moment, out of my Bible. And um, it's Matthew 2, 1 through 16, if you want to read. We'll, I'll put the scriptures up as I go through them, but I wanted to kind of give you an overview because it's neat to see the whole story in one story. Here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where is the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I may go too and worship him. Uh -huh. So after that, they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose uh, went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down to worship him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When the angel had gone, oh, when, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old or younger, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So, pretty dramatic thing we saw there. And in those first two verses, we see this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? When he saw his, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So, we open with Jesus' birth, and Matthew gives specifics. He, he tells us it happened in Bethlehem. He says, in the town of David, and, and he gives names of King Herod, and so you can know the dates of all of this happening. You all remember great, like, King Herod. He's great King Herod, you know, Herod the Great, and, and he was this uh, leader of the Herodian Empire. We talked a couple weeks ago about how evil this man was, and he was the worst of all the Herods, okay? So Jesus is born in this moment. When Herod is king, Matthew sets the stage for the worst situation a baby boy Messiah could be born into, with King Herod as the ruler. And then also in Luke, the, the same account in Luke, he also gives names and dates and, and major events that are recorded in outside sources. Because both of these authors, both of these gospel writers want you to know this happened, and it was a big deal. And so, these magi we meet, they're coming from the east. And what, what does that mean? Like, where east? Far east? Is that the orient of the old? Or is it that... Well, they come from the east, which is really Arabia and Persia. And they present themselves to this ruthless king. And they ask, hey, where's the king of the Jews? To the Jewish king, 
who's named himself king. And uh, they go as far as to say, we're, we're here to worship, not you, that other one, that, that king of the Jews. And um, so these magi seem like they kind of walked into a palace to the king and totally disrespected that king. That's what it felt like. So, so who are these guys? Who are the wise men? Who are the magi? It's a really important thing to understand. They, um, they, so the word magi comes from the plural magus, which means a member of a priestly caste from ancient Persia. And we find these men mentioned in the Old Testament a bunch uh, during the Babylonian stories. And they're referred to as magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, and diviners. They were advisors to the king of Babylon over and over and over again. We hear their story. And they were of high social status. So, ancient world shows that this is Israel. And you have this fertile crescent because the rivers. This is a desert, the Arabian desert. And then over here is where all civilization, civilization started. Whether you're a Christian or not, all civilization started over here. And it's amazing how the Bible correlates to that with archaeology and all of the studies. But over here you see Babylon... Or you've heard these stories. This is modern-day Iraq. This is where these guys were from, the east, okay? There's a huge desert in between. So these Magi were located in southern Arabia, in the east of the Holy Land, and they traveled, for this story, 900 miles to get to Jerusalem. 900 miles from modern-day Iraq to Jerusalem. But why did they make that journey? What were they looking for? So kings were appointed all the time in the old world. Some appointed themselves. King Herod appointed himself, right? Kings came and went. Why this king? Why did they come to see the king of the Jews? There's something important about that, right? They didn't go see Herod when Herod said, I'm king. There's a reason they came. So why travel now at this moment? And what was so special about this trip? And the biggest question, what were they expecting when they got there? So before we answer that question fully, how did Herod respond to these men? Not well. So, uh, Matthew 2, 3 and 4 says this. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? So, hey, where, where is this guy? Where is this, this guy I'm going to go worship, right? So, he has a visitation from these wise men from the east, and upon hearing it, he's not happy with it. And so, of course, um, he knows he appointed himself as king of the Jews. And he's not fully Jewish. Remember, we talked about the, the Herodian Empire. They're kind of partially Jewish from way back when. But they kind of decided to rule the Jewish people, and so they appointed themselves. He's more of a political king. He's in with the Romans, and he's appointed himself. He's a builder. This Herod the Great built the new temple. I mean, he built it right before Jesus' birth. And, and so he's a builder, but he's ruthless. But he's self-appointed. So there's some insecurity in Herod. Because he knows he's not the true king of the Jews. He knows all the prophets have said there is going to be a Messiah, the king of the Jews. And he knows it's not him. So he's dealing with insecurity, even though he's the king. And so these guys show up, and they're like, hey, where's the king? Not you. Where's the king? And all that insecurity, all that stuff just bubbles up inside of him, right? So he's obviously threatened by this statement. So he needs to figure it out, solve this riddle, right? So he calls in the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. He's like, hey, is there a prophecy about a Jewish king coming? And, the, and they immediately have the answer. This is important. They knew the answer right away. Matthew 2, 5 and 6 says, In Bethlehem in Judea, they even told you where it was going to happen. This is the Pharisees. For this is what the prophet has written. And this is from Micah 5, 2 is what they're quoting, Okay. But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So the Pharisees were well aware of this Micah prophecy from 500 years before, that right around this time there would be a Jewish prophet, Messiah, born, and he would become king of the Jews. And it would be out of the line of Judah, it would be in the city of David, all the details were there. They even referred to him as a shepherd. This is the Pharisees in Herod's court. So something struck me about this moment, that Herod asked religious leaders about what all this was, and they had the answer. Isn't that interesting? They, they knew the right answer, but it didn't move them to be interested in finding the Messiah. That's interesting, right? If you would think these guys, their whole life, are looking towards the Messiah, and when they hear it might be happening, they don't investigate that. 
And actually, from this moment on, we don't hear about them again. These Pharisees and his leaders, who are in all essence the Sanhedrin. We don't hear about them again until 30 years later, when they call for the crucifixion of this same boy. Um, these religious leaders missed it. From this moment on, we can think of them as plotting against whatever is going to come out of all of this. And it's just incredible. Six miles away from them in Bethlehem is the fulfillment of every promise God ever made. And they didn't take a step to go figure out what that was all about. Uh, they were blind to its significance. And this is important to say that a knowledge of the scriptures without a desire to draw close to God means nothing. Their religion held them back from um, actually meeting the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I wrote it this way. Knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. If they truly were expecting and looking forward to the Messiah, which they said they were out of all of their study, they would have rushed to Bethlehem at the earliest rumors of a Savior being born. But instead, I think they loved the stories more than they loved the author of the stories. And uh, they were not living a life expectant for God to move in any way. The past 400 years of darkness had made them cold and made them religious and made them not expect for God to move in any mighty way. So when it happened, they missed it. But the opposite is true of the Magi, who came seeking truth, and they were expectant. And the rest of the story teaches us, this is how we should respond to the good news. How the Magi responded. So Matthew 2, 7 and 8 tells us what they did. So, then Herod called the Magi secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for this child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I may too go and worship him. So Herod pulls these guys into a secret meeting and wants to know when the first star showed up. When did it show up? When did you, when did you head out on your journey there, Magi, wise men? Because remember, the star that's guiding the, the Magi to the king of the Jews appeared when Jesus was born. But this is not the same moment as he's born. The star has been up for a while. And we see later that Herod is trying to figure out how old a boy I need to kill from there below, which he said two years old. So we know the Magi showed up when Jesus was probably a toddler at some point, uh, months and months after his birth. So we already read that his intention, Herod's intention, was not to throw Jesus a birthday party based on the age of the star. It was to take him out, take out the king of the Jews, and he really tried that at the very end of the story. We hear that. Um, so he pretends to be interested in worshiping him. But the wise men are wise for a reason, right? So they see right through this. They had discernment. They were smart. They traveled expectantly. And they were not going to let anybody get in the way of them meeting Jesus. And so they were not swayed by political powers or the religious. And uh, so they moved on. So here, we're, Matthew 2, 9, 10 says this. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When, the, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So it's interesting, right? The star that they had been following appears to have gone away when they entered Jerusalem because it reappeared to them. After meeting Herod, they walked out to go to Bethlehem, and the star reappeared over Jesus' home. Um, as I read and studied, like I guess like, ah! I got fascinated with um, the idea of this star and what it was, right? And you can go deep dive onto what this star was. And um, was it a constellation? Was it a comet? Was it an angel? Was it a combination of all those things, you know? And there's so many thoughts and ideas on it. It's like a whole like PhD study on what the star was. Well, um, there's naturalistic thoughts on it, like, oh, it was this constellation moving through this, and Jupiter moving, there's all that. And then there's the idea that God just placed it there, like the miracle of just God using the heavens to guide these men. Either way, though, I wanted to land on this point, um, that these wise men saw a star, and they followed it to the Savior of the world. Whatever the mechanism, whatever it is, uh, the fact that the star led the Magi to Christ is evidence that the star was uniquely designed by God, made for a very special purpose. And sometimes God will use extraordinary means to declare His glory. So, certainly, the 
the birth of Christ uh, was an opportunity where God uh, could place something in the heavens to lead us there. And it's fitting that God would use a celestial object to announce the birth of Christ, since in Psalm 19 we read this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of His hands. Psalm 19 is, is one of those verses where you say God can do whatever He wants in the heavens. And uh, this star, this light, guided men uh, to the place where Jesus was, right at the right time, to the, the feet of the Savior. And, um, and so God did this. But the question still remains, why did these guys travel 900 miles? How did they know what this new star in the sky was, anyway? And um, what were they expecting when they arrived? And I believe the Magi, the wise men, came to Jerusalem, came to Bethlehem, fully expecting to meet the Messiah. There was no doubt in their mind. They had to step out in faith into the unknown and risk their livelihoods in order to encounter the living God. But they were confident they would. And I believe their story should inspire us to walk in this season with expectation that we can encounter God in a powerful way during this Advent season. They pursued God um, because they had a desire to draw close to God, unlike the religious leaders. They wanted to know God more. And they got to experience something that few would ever get to experience. But their faith was not blind, and that's an important thing. They did not walk into this blindly. They were confident that God would meet them on the other side of this journey. So the question remains, how did they know that, and why did they do this? Why did they travel 900 miles across the desert to meet Jesus? And the answer really is, they've been waiting 600 years to do this. Let me explain. So, in 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, and he carried off the best and the brightest to Babylon. We saw it earlier. Jerusalem to Babylon. One of those men, young men was Daniel. We've all heard of Daniel, Daniel Lions Den, right? And most are familiar with his story, but I want to remind you of some details about Daniel so that it all kind of comes together. Um, Daniel, this young Jewish man, like the best of the Jewish men, uh, he's serving in the king's palace in Babylon, but Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about a statue. This big statue, right? And uh, it bothered him enough where he called in all of his wise men to interpret it for him. And we see this in Daniel 2, 1 and 2. It says this, In the second year of his reign, so early on, Nebuchadnezzar's new to this king thing, he's this dream, right? Nebuchadnezzar has dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. And he said, I'm not even going to tell you the dream. Tell me the dream, and then interpret the dream for me, right? And so, no one could interpret this dream. They couldn't even tell him what the dream was. And so the king's just enraged. He's like, I'm killing all y'all wise men. You're not wise. I'm killing you. And Daniel steps in and says, hey, give me one night. Let me pray to God. He'll give me your dream and the interpretation, and don't kill all these wise men. So the king's like, okay, do it. So Daniel sought God. He prayed. And God revealed to him the dream and its interpretation. And God revealed to Daniel mysteries of the future. And that's important. What would happen to Nebuchadnezzar? What would happen to these kings? And he was able to speak to Nebuchadnezzar about this. And Nebuchadnezzar rewarded him and promoted him. We see it in Daniel 2, 48. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. So Daniel is the chief magi. Daniel is the chief wise man. And it did not stop there for Daniel. Years later, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, took over the kingdom, and during a banquet he saw this hand writing on the wall. We've probably maybe heard that story. And it really bothered him. He became pale. And this queen who was with him said, Hey, this is guy Daniel. With your dad, he interpreted this dream. You should get him. So we see this in Daniel 5.11. It says this, There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So again, they call on Daniel, and he enters, and he interprets this message from God, and is rewarded and promoted once again, Daniel 5.29 says this, 
Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom, which would have been the third highest ruler in the whole world at this time. So Daniel serves under kings. He's the head of the Magi, and then towards the end of his life, he prays to God for a vision. He's like, God, I need a vision for my people. And you see this in Daniel 9, I'm not going to read you the whole thing. But to summarize, Daniel prays for vision, and God gives him a vision for his people. And the vision is delivered by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. It says, in 500 years, the anointed one, the Messiah, will come in to Bethlehem. Be looking towards the west for a sign. So, this coincides with all these prophets from Isaiah and, and Micah and these other prophecies. And, and so Daniel, write, Daniel writes it down. And, um, and we see it in Isaiah. We see this line, and I love this. Isaiah 63 and 6 says this. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn, light and the darkness. Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba, from Ethiopia, will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Isaiah wrote that down, about the suffering servant, about Jesus. Micah wrote down, in the line of Judah in Bethlehem. And Daniel writes down, in Daniel 9, you should read it, about the anointed one being born 500 years from now. Daniel writes down his vision and teaches the Magi. Hey, look. Look to the west in 500 years. Look for a sign from God in the heavens. He tells them to look for the stars. Look for the heavens for a sign. At the appointed one, the Messiah will come. And when he comes, you go. So these men remember Daniel, their chief Magi. And they passed down this prophecy for generations. So as the time approached, they were looking to the skies. As the time approached, these magicians, these wise men said, something's coming. It's in our generation, it's coming. And Jesus was born, the star appeared, and these wise men from the east were ready. Can you imagine being in that generation of Magi? Like, at that 480 year mark, and you're like the new wise men, you're like, wait, this is it? It's coming, and you're just like looking. Every night, you're just like, God, where is it, where is it, right? Just that expectation, that anticipation. 500 years, and now they were going to meet the one. It's just incredible. It gives me chills thinking about it. They're an incredible example, though, of stepping out in faith, believing in Christ before they saw Christ. They stepped out and went on a journey towards God before they actually met God. And throughout Scripture, we see when we seek God and we're determined to meet God, He meets us right there. We see it in Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. They cashed it all in, and they sought God with all their heart. He's not hiding from us. He's always waiting for us, and He's ready to welcome us in with loving arms into an intimate relationship with Him. He's just waiting for us to seek Him out. And that's what Advent is all about. So, have you been waiting for God to show up in your life? Well, I'm here to tell you He's already arrived. Um, and uh, it's on each of us to make the decision to pursue him and seek him out, just like the wise men did. They left the comfort of their lives in Persia. They were set up. I mean, they were in charge. They were living a lush life. They left that life, stepped out in faith, and traveled across the desert for a chance to meet the Messiah. Matthew 2, 11 and 12 so, tells us how this went. On coming to the house... They saw the child with his mother Mary. So they're not in a manger. They're not in a cave. They're in a house. And this is a child. Very clear in the writings that this is an older child. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So these men, these magi, these descendants of Daniel have finally met the King of Heaven. And the first thing they do is worship Him. They kneel at the feet of this toddler and they worship. And I believe that should be all of our responses when we meet Jesus. It should just be worship. And if you've never had that moment with Jesus, then I don't know if you've actually met Jesus. Because it should make us worship. But then, they presented gifts to this King of Kings. 
They sacrificed what was theirs to bless the king. They let go of what was in their hands to the king. They knew that worldly possessions meant nothing in the face of the one who created everything. And so they presented what they had and gave it to this newborn king, but not just any gifts. Specifically, we hear gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So these are all very intentional. Uh, they're decided on by God what would be here, what would be described as the gifts. And I think uh, as I describe them, you might see it in a different light that you've never seen it before. So, you have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold was a very common um, gift to give to a king, to royalty. By doing this, they declared their understanding of his royal lineage, both earthly and heavenly. Incense, frankincense, was offered only to gods. A lot of human leaders who thought of themselves as gods demanded incense to be burned to them. So when they gave Jesus this, it was their idea of worship. We're worshiping you. Um, and they, uh, we'll talk about this in a couple weeks, but this word Emmanuel, which is Jesus' name, means God with us. So this God has come to live with us, so they're going to worship him. But the myrrh is always confusing, right? People are like, myrrh? What's myrrh, right? We don't know what myrrh is anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. So myrrh actually represents death and burial. This is an embalming situation. It's something that you embalm the dead with. And so you're kind of like, well, wait, how does this make sense to give to a baby? Well, Daniel's prophecy of the anointed one um, was very clear that the same Messiah would be put to death for us. They knew the sacrifice that this baby was going to make one day. And so when they gave these gifts, it represented something different. That he was king, that he was God. And he was the sacrifice. All three in one. These men lived their whole lives with the expectation of meeting the Messiah, knowing that they had to step out in faith to get close to God, but they're meeting the King and the Lord of Lords, the, the God above all things, but that they're meeting the same God that would die for them one day. Um, and so they got to step out in faith and experience a miracle of meeting this baby. And they gifted him with these things that would carry him through his life. These men um, encountered something that my prayer is that we all get to encounter. But I think these men left changed after this moment. And I wrote it this way. A moment in God's presence can change everything. These men went back to Arabia different. And um, God's always up to something, right? So when, when you enter into his presence, we think it's one thing. And then sometimes God makes it something else. So um, they came with gifts. They worshipped. They gave gifts. And they left to change. We have to ask, like, um, these men met Jesus, left gifts for a baby that included death and burial, embalming uh, spices and seasoning. So why did they do that? As they leave, we learn that um, uh, Jesus is a toddler, but he's actually going to grow up and be our Savior, and everything that they gave him was going to be used throughout his life. Um, uh, these men brought gifts. Um, why did they know to bring gifts? Well, they knew their Old Testament. They knew the prophecies of God, and they came to be a part of God's ultimate plan for Jesus. Let's read Matthew 2, 13-15, and maybe it'll make sense to you. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Wait, wait, like, this doesn't make sense, right? This is the savior of the world. He can't die as a toddler. So he got up. This is Joseph, the father, the poor, like, carpenter father. And took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I will call my son. You see, the moment these guys left, Herod put an, an execution order out for two-year-old child uh, boys and under. And these men arrived with gifts for Jesus. 
that allowed a poor family to flee town. There's no way to leave town if you don't have gold. There's no way to move if you can't afford to move. And so these men showed up, and to this poor, holy family gave means to get out. The gifts who seem impractical to a baby, gold for a baby, frankincense for a baby, like myrrh for a baby, all had an intention and a purpose. The gold allowed them to travel to Egypt for a time so that Jesus would be saved, so that he could come and then save us. And when they returned, years later, Hosea 11.1 1 says, uh, he'll emerge from Egypt. And so without these men allowing them to flee to Egypt, the prophecy of Hosea would never have been fulfilled. How amazing is our God that he would, 600 years before, equip Daniel to lead a kingdom, to prophesy about the coming Messiah, pass that down to wise men for 500 years, who would travel across the desert with gifts to meet the newborn king, to be able to provide for him things that would allow him to leave for Egypt, worship him as king, and I wonder if Mary had held on to that myrrh to anoint his body 33 years later. God's redemption story is one that never fails to amaze me. He uses the faithful to usher in his kingdom and his plan for the world. The Magi lived for hundreds of years with the expectation of the Savior. They passed that down generation after generation. Hey, just, he's coming, he's coming. And these group of men were in a position to experience it. And because of their expectation and preparation, they got to be a part of God's greater plan. So, I ask you, what are you looking forward to this Christmas? And no, we are not wise men. And no, Jesus is not being reborn on Christmas Day. Um, but God's redemption story is still available, and Jesus can still be experienced in the same powerful way these men got to experience him. But the only reason they got to experience Jesus and get caught up in this greater story is because they desired an audience with the king. And when the opportunity presented itself to step into relationship, they stepped in full of faith. So this Advent season, my prayer is that each of us, like the wise men, change our perspective on what we're expecting this Christmas. What's it going to bring for our lives, for our family's lives? And instead of looking forward to presents, time off, or Christmas carols, which are all wonderful things, uh, we should be looking forward to the birth of our Savior and stepping into faith to draw close to Him, to worship Him, and to ultimately be changed by Him, like these wise men were changed. The first Christmas divided our calendars, and these wise men were looking for a sign, and then they stepped out in faith in order to experience a moment in God's presence, and the entire world has never been the same. So as we step into Advent season, let our hearts be expectant. Let us seek above all other things an audience with the King of Kings. And let us do all we can to draw close to Jesus, because a moment in his presence really does change everything. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for these stories, these true stories of people stepping out in faith, for an audience with the King. You say clearly in your word, Lord God, if we draw close to you, you draw close to us. If we seek you with all of our heart, we will find you, Lord God. And that is our prayer for everyone in this community to draw close to you, to seek you during this Christmas season. People who've never known you before, Lord God, that they'll be, be able to meet you right where they're at, Lord God. Um, and their whole lives be changed. And people who might have been kicking the tires or going through the motions of faith, Lord God, that, that this season will become real for them, um, what these magi learned to be real for them, Lord God, that the Savior of the world has come, and uh, he has come to bring light into the darkness, and we are welcomed into that light, Lord God. So I just pray for each and every person that they uh, receive that, that free gift of salvation today, Lord God, that they step into a new life with you, expectant that you can do all things uh, because you are the Lord of the Lord. You are the King of Kings. You are worthy of our worship, Lord God. And we just uh, praise your holy name today. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.